he will come like last leaves fall. One night, when the November wind has flayed the trees to the bone, an earth wakes, choking on the mould, the soft shrouds folding. He will come like frost. One morning, when the shrinking earth opens on mist, to find itself arrested in the net of alien, sword-set beauty. He will come like dark. One evening, when the bursting red December sun opens up the sheet and Penny masks its eye to yield the star-snowed fields of sky. He will come, will come, will come like crying in the night, like blood, like breaking as the earth rives to toss him. He will come, like child. Hello, and welcome to Windows on Worship. My name is Carl, and it's really great to have you with us, especially if you're tuning in for the first time. You're very welcome. Today we once again begin our journey through the season of Advent, a season of expectant waiting as we await the coming again anew into our world, of the one who shows us just how much value God places, not just on every single human being, but on all that God has made, because God shows up in our neighbourhood. Our Advent theme for this year is that of longing, and we'll begin to explore it by looking at two very different passages, one from the prophet Isaiah and one from Matthew's Gospel, that look ahead to the kingdom of God coming in its fullness, and in particular the unexpected nature of the return of the Son of Man. Before we get started on any of that, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the worship sheet accompanying this act of worship. You can find the link for that in the YouTube video description, but you might need to click on Show More in order to reveal it. The front side of the worship sheet has some space for you to make your own notes as we go along some questions for you to ponder along the way, and various places where you're invited to share your thoughts and prayers with others in the comments section, particularly if you're watching the premiere and can use the live chat function in YouTube. The reverse side of the worship sheet contains the jukebox playlist, a set of YouTube videos chosen especially to help you go further in your praying and pondering through the week. And so, as we gather together before God in our different places, using the gift of technology, we bring our opening responses for this Advent season. The words of these responses, and indeed the words of all the prayers and responses we'll be sharing in together today, will appear on the screen. Please join in with those words in yellow and bold type, either in your head or out loud, as you're most comfortable. Let us pray. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Let there be light. On those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Let there be light. The true light has come into the world to dispel the darkness. Let there be light. The people groaned amid the gathering darkness, longing for the something that would change everything, for the dawning of the new day after the long night of exile, for the boiling over of God's life from eternity into time. The people thirsted and ate for streams of living water the signs of new life springing up in the deserts of despair, for the change that would free them 
to be at home with God, but without really knowing what that would mean. The people preferred their own darkness and shadows to the fire on the earth God's truth brings raining down. But God promised to dwell with them as Emmanuel, love inhabited humanly, made vulnerable and defenceless. God of Advent, give us the courage to leave our darkness behind and the faith to draw near to you, stepping into the light of your truth, love and hope. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the radical answer to Israel's longings and the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we offer a starter for 10 question that's there to get you thinking about the subject matter for the week. You might want to share your response to this question with others by typing it into either the main comments or the live chat. Equally, you might just want to ponder it to yourself and that's absolutely fine too. So this week's starter for 10 is, what might it look like? to long for God to be present among us? And what difference do you hope this might make? Our New Testament canticle for this week is called Saviour of the World and is taken from the Methodist hymn book Singing the Faith, number 795. Let us pray. Jesus, Saviour of the World, come to us in your mercy. We look to you to save and help us. By your cross and your life laid down, you set your people free. We look to you to save and help us. When they were ready to perish, you saved your disciples. We look to you to come to our help. In the greatness of your mercy, loose us from our chains. Forgive the sins of all your people. Make yourself known as our saviour and mighty deliverer. Save us and help us, that we may praise you. Come now and dwell with us, Lord Christ Jesus. Hear our prayer and be with us always. And when you come in your glory, make us to be one with you and to share in the life of your kingdom. Amen. As we gather together before God today, we come being aware that there is much in our own lives and in the life of our church and world in need of God's renewal and light this day. And so with that in mind, we now bring our prayers of renewal. 
Let us pray. God of light, you call us out of the darkness, both of ignorance of your love and mistrust of your ways. God of hope, forgive us and free us. God of light, you call us out of the darkness, both of indifference towards the needs of others and the undervaluing of ourselves. God of hope, forgive us and free us. God of light, you call us out of the darkness, both of unjust ways of ordering the world and the blind pursuit of self-interest. God of hope, forgive us and free us. God of light and hope, make us ready to meet with you. Amen. Our readings for this week come firstly from the prophet Isaiah, from chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, and then secondly from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. As you hear these readings read, keep your ear open for any particular words or phrases or ideas that jump out at you. There's a space provided on the worship sheet to make a note of these things, because these could point to those things God's Holy Spirit especially wants to say to you today through these texts. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus said to his disciples, But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day of Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, 
one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. I love the season of Advent. In fact, I'd go as far as to say I think it's my favourite time of the Christian year, for a variety of reasons. Chief amongst them is that Advent is a time in which we specifically set out to remind ourselves of how our deepest human longings, our most heartfelt desires, are addressed by our God. And addressed not through the clever arguments of philosophers or the rousing rhetoric of politicians, but instead in the vulnerability and defencelessness of the divine sharing in our humanity. What theologians term the doctrine of the Incarnation is a twofold thing. On the one hand, it's a public declaration, a public declaration of the word capital W through whom and for whom creation came into being and who became flesh in the very person of Jesus Christ. But as well as a public declaration, it's also an intimate whisper, the intimate whisper of lovers talk, if I can put it like that. And so in the holding of these two things together, in God becoming fully human and fully divine, we can see that it's as much about God's intimacy with us as it is about God's authority. Into that silence of the nothing that God would make something, the word capital W is spoken by God through the fiery whirlwind of the Holy Spirit. And thus there is light and life. Words, if you think about it, are very powerful things. Indeed, as the author Jeanette Winterson puts it, words are the parts of silence that can be spoken. It's in that silence, that apparent nothing that God makes into something, in which, if we take the time, we might well hear the word of God, capital W, speak anew in this Advent season. Now, as we work our way through Advent towards the celebration of Christmas Day, we engage with a story with which many of us are intimately familiar. Indeed, a story that many of us have known by heart since we were very small children and began taking part in nativity plays of one sort or another. That in one way is a blessing but in another, it can be a curse. And that's because the temptation is that when we're very familiar with a story, we stop really listening to it. We fill all of those silences with our own words, with our own retelling. And that means that the Word of God, capital W, can so easily get drowned out, rather than being heard as if really for the first time. God answers our deepest longings, our most heartfelt desires, by becoming one of us. And yet, the tragedy is that so often we fail to see or hear. Today's extract from the prophetic oracles of First Isaiah, several of which we will engage with during this Advent season on Windows on Worship, the first of these concerns a phrase which is among the most famous in the Hebrew scriptures, picturing a time to come when swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and nations will no longer need to wage war against one another or learn the art of war, as it were. But for all that that text is very famous, I think it's the opening of today's passage, what we find in verse 1, 
which is actually the most interesting part. Isaiah, son of Amos, the original Isaiah, the one called in chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, with the hot call on the tongue in the throne room of God, that Isaiah recalled the word concerning Judah and Jerusalem, but not the word that they heard or they read, but the word they saw. Saw, like the word of God, capital W, made human, could be seen. Now, just as in Jesus's day, the people of God at that time faced political insecurity and turmoil. In that case, because of the danger posed by the Assyrians, who were the dominant power in the region at that stage. In the midst of that turmoil, Isaiah anticipates God doing something truly new and addressing the deep longings of Israel in the north and Judah in the south for that something which would change everything. And so, into the silences of fear and uncertainty, a word of peace and a word of hope for the days to come is offered, but not exclusively to Judea and Jerusalem, but to all the nations, to all who would flock to God to learn of God's ways and follow God's paths. When we read this passage from a Christian perspective, we might add that the calling in the final verse, verse 5, to walk in the light of the Lord, leads to us seeing anew, seeing now by the light of light, who is also the light of the world. Now that same light in the midst of adversity is also there in our reading from Matthew's Gospel. It may feel slightly surreal that we are, find ourselves reading an extract from the Holy Week story, as Matthew tells it, in this Advent season when we look ahead to the birth of Jesus. But the content of today's reading is very much, much of a muchness with what we found in Isaiah. So to put it all into context, Jesus had arrived in Jerusalem with his disciples ready for the festival of Passover. And he was teaching in the temple courtyard. He was teaching his disciples and those in the crowds who had come to listen to what he had to say. In particular, he dealt with various conflicts and controversies stirred up by other Jewish religious leaders who were opposed to him. Now, when looking at the temple, someone in Jesus's party had remarked upon the many beautiful gifts that adorned it and its complexity and costly stonework. It was being remade by Herod the Great at that time. But in response to that, Jesus tells his friends that not a single stone will be left standing, in a probable reference to its destruction by the Romans in the year 70, which had already happened by the time Matthew's Gospel was put together. The disciples in turn asked Jesus, well, when is this going to happen and what are the warning signs we need to look out for? And that launches us into one of the most challenging sections of this most Jewish of Gospels, as it depicts the second advent. Now, some of the imagery in what has become known as the Olivet Discourse or the Olivet Apocalypse, because it takes place on the Mount of Olives, is very dramatic and cosmic. It's taken from prophetic warnings like Isaiah 13 verse 10 and the depiction of the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds from heaven that we find in Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14. Other images in this section that runs from Matthew 24 to the end of chapter 25 are much more readily relatable. So, for example, immediately before today's passage in Matthew 24 verse 32, Jesus looks to the fig tree putting out new leaves as a sign that summer is near. It's a way of revealing the predictable imminence of his coming. But conversely, the warnings that we find in today's passage in verses 36 to 44 about avoiding being caught out by the unexpected timing of the Son of Man's coming highlight the unpredictable suddenness of God's actions. And so we're left with two contrasting dynamics that we need to hold in tension. 
the predictable imminence of God's coming, but also its unpredictable suddenness. And when we hold those two things together in creative tension, predictable imminence, unpredictable suddenness, we're reminded that we really do need to be alert for the one who is coming, even when we don't know the how or the when. Indeed, in Matthew's Gospel, we learn that even the Son did not know the how and the when. It was only the Father who knew that. So thinking about this creative tension brings us back to what it is that we think we're doing in this expectant waiting period we call Advent. You see, when God comes to dwell with us as Emmanuel, God with us, when, to put it a different way, the love and the life of God boils over from divine eternity into created time. This doesn't happen by virtue of God somehow rendering the heavens asunder. No, when the light and the love of God, the Word of God, capital W, comes to us in a unique way in the very person of Jesus Christ, God does all of this humanly. In short, God respects our world, not by blowing it to pieces, but by working within it, by establishing relationships and by filling out that world from within. And most importantly, God takes the risk of defenceless love in order to make all the difference in the world. Now this means as much as a great deal of religious language might suggest otherwise to us, that God doesn't need to be bribed or pestered into caring for us, into being on our side, if you will. In the same way that when we pass on a candle flame from one person to another, the flames are not diminished, so God holds nothing back when the word capital W became flesh. And hence we can talk about Jesus as God from God as light from light. And moreover, the period of Advent, as well as having these profound theological themes running through it, is about a readiness for an encounter with God in which everything is changed through letting go. In other words, by being ready to come to God with a defencelessness, which, if we take it seriously, ought to be as frightful as it is joyful. Now if all of that's going to happen, as Rowan Williams, to whom I'm indebted for a great deal of this Advent imagery, notes, we will need to take time to slow down. We will need to be prepared to enter into that nothing that God makes something. We will need to listen out for the word capital W amid the silences. To put it another way, using a slightly different image, what we need to do in this season of Advent, as much as anything else, is to take the time to see ourselves as reflected in the divine mirror that enables taking an honest look at ourselves. The prophet Isaiah did this, having witnessed firsthand the ways in which the people of God fell short of their calling to be the light to the nations. Isaiah recognised that putting things right would necessitate being refined in the fire of God's love. An image that we find in chapter 1 verses 21 to 31 of Isaiah and which was also picked up by Micah in Micah chapter 4 writing around the same time. Now this being refined in the fire is something that also applies to us today because as I've said many times previously well, it's absolutely true that God loves us just as we are. God also loves us too much just to leave us where we are. And so then, in this season of Advent, God challenges us to get ourselves ready to be changed, to enter into those risky, silent places in order to hear the story of the Incarnation as if for the first time, and thus to be transformed in the process. Moreover, just as God works humanly, 
So we as disciples are called to work humanly as we look to put God's love into action, whether that's through offering warm spaces to people in our community who are struggling to heat their homes and put food on the table, or any of the other myriad ways in which we might express our commitment to being disciples of Jesus Christ. The deep longing that the peoples of Israel and Judah had for the something that would change everything was indeed fulfilled in that unplanned and overwhelming coming of Jesus Christ into the world. And likewise, even though we cannot know the when or the how of God speaking the word capital W anew into our world, we do know and we can put our trust in who is coming. The mystery of Advent and Christmas is that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. And contrary to how it might feel when the darkness appears to ensnare us and the silences are frightening rather than comfortable, the light of God will never be extinguished and the word of God, capital W, can never be silenced. And so as we begin our Advent journey for another year, we can thus say, I think, thanks be to God. Amen.
We come now then, friends, to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. During this time, if you have a prayer request you'd like the Windows on Worship team to pick up and follow up for you, do type that into the main comments or the live chat. But as usual, if you're going to reference a specific individual, do only use their initials. Running through today's prayers, there is a response. When I say, God of light, please respond with the words, shine in the darkness. Let us pray. God of Advent hope, as we wait expectantly for the coming of Jesus into the world, as a vulnerable baby and through defenceless love, we bring our prayers for others to you. God of light, shine in the darkness. We pray for all who have lost livelihoods and businesses and all who are struggling to make ends meet right now. God of light, shine in the darkness. We pray for all who work in our emergency services in particular in the NHS and in social care as winter pressures build up. God of light, shine in the darkness. We pray for all who dread the lead up to Christmas time, especially those who will reluctantly spend this season alone. God of light, shine in the darkness. We pray for all who fear that you have left the building, that might... We pray for all who fear that you have left the building, that they might discover anew your love and care. God of light, shine in the darkness. We pray for all who are scared to risk loving other people and that we may set off cascades of grace, revealing your love to all. God of light, shine in the darkness. We pray for all who have lost loved ones during this past year and all those who are unwell in mind, body or spirit. God of light, shine in the darkness. In a time of quiet and stillness, we now bring the people and situations on our hearts to you, loving God. And so we bring all that we thought about and prayed about together in the words of the family prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. God of overflowing love, whose body language cannot help but speak grace, whose life and light boils over into our broken world, not rending the heavens, but filling out that world from within. We thank you that you identify so completely with us, that in Jesus Christ, you became one of us. We thank you that we don't have to persuade you to care or flatter or manipulate you into being interested in us. For you know our longings and desires and contradictions, and you change everything through your defenceless love. Help us to take the time we need this Advent 
to be surprised and frightened and astonished by the wonder of the word made flesh, God from God and light from light. Amen. So thank you for joining us for Windows on Worship this week. I hope you found this act of worship helpful and thought provoking. A link to the jukebox playlist that I mentioned at the beginning of this act of worship will pop up on the screen towards the end of this video. It contains a number of Advent hymns, an exploration of what we mean when we talk about Advent, and a Bible study looking in great depth at our two passages for this week. In order to access all of these materials and keep in touch with Windows on Worship more easily, you may want to hit the subscribe button, which will also pop up on the screen towards the end of this video. And don't forget that on the worship sheet, as well as links to all of these videos and spaces to make your own notes, you will find some Bible study questions to help you go deeper in your praying and pondering. But for now, as our time together draws to its close for another week, our prayer of blessing. Journey onward in the light of faith and shine brightly. Step forward in the strength of faith and be bold. And as you go, remember that you do so with the blessing of God the Father, the peace of Jesus the Son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.